And with that, I would like you all to help me introduce a welcome. <laughs> Pastor Billy Crone, let me tell you, I've been truly blessed with him by his teaching, his messages. We talked on Thursday. I've, I just gleaned from all these resources that he puts out, and prayerfully, you will as well. And I do pray that you will just be blessed by this teaching this morning. So, Pastor, without further ado, I'm not going to take your time. Please come up. Awesome. Thank you, Pastor Mac. Good to see you. Awesome. How are you guys doing? Good. Good to see you. Once again, you know why? Because it's really weird preaching to an empty auditorium. You guys were paying attention on the last one. But uh, uh, hey, just wanted to, again, once again, announce uh, how many guys were here Thursday or the previous service? Raise your hand. All right, praise God. So we got some new folks. Just to let you know, those messages are uh, apparently online. You can check those out. But if you want to go even deeper, because basically what I'm covering is uh, the highlights of a study that we have called The Final Countdown, Tribulation Rising, Volume 1, dealing with the Jewish people and the Antichrist. 20 plus hour study, 20 studies on this. Uh, we also have this. This is DVDs. We have a book. We also have, I forgot to mention the previous two studies, uh, that we have this available in a Bible study curriculum. So it's great for Sunday school classes or churches and things of that nature. But that's where basically what you're about to see today, uh, this study is coming from if you want to get more. We also just came out with the second volume on modern technology. Hot off the press, you can check that out as well. Uh, we have a few items left on the table out there if you want to check it out there. But if we're, it's almost all gone. Uh, so if you want to get it online, you go to... GetAlifeMedia.com. Where's that at? That's called GetAlifeMedia.com. Who said that? There's an echo in here. GetAlifeMedia.com. Uh, you can get that more. Or, as I've been saying, uh, you could also stay in touch with our ministry via our app. We have a new app uh, simply called the Billy Crone app. C-R-O-N-E. Search with your Android or Apple device, tablet, phone, whatever, in the app store. Just search for my name, Billy Crone, and you can download that for free. You get basically for free eight years worth of studies. Prophecy studies, apologetics, theology, you name it, all over the place, book studies. It's all up there for free. Uh, also, again, we do not copyright our media. So if you get our media, and every single piece of media has the gospel presentation on it, deliberately, because it's not only for our own edification, it's for evangelization. And if you ever happen to get the DVDs of anything, make a billion copies. We actually say, please copy on the writings. Make as many copies as you can, give it away to as many people as you can. It's almost like we're in the last days, and it's time to get motivated. Amen? We're not trying to build a castle here on earth. We're trying to store up treasure in heaven. So let's work together as God's team. All right. Well, you guys ready? Yep. All right. I've got to ask you this question, though, because you guys look like Christians, <laughs> right? How many of you guys as Christians believe in miracles? Amen. Raise your hand. Well, if I'm going to get this done in three hours, you're going to see one. That's right. No, <laughs> not to freak you out. I think we'll be on time, sort of, maybe. Famous last words for a preacher. But uh, let's go ahead and begin in prayer. Father, thank you so much for our next study. As we once again take a look at your word and take a look at the future, Nobody has a brighter future than we, your church. And we're so thankful for that. That's why we got done singing uh, so many wonderful love songs to you through music with the, 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 the great worship team. And God, we uh, thank you for that privilege. We also thank you for the privilege of your word and that you tell us in advance what's coming, not to freak us out, but to prepare us. And the rapture is not something that's scary. That's best case scenario. We get, we get to leave this, frankly, a garbage can compared to what heaven's going to be like, and, and to go be with you. No more sin, no more of that baloney, no more of these struggles, no more of this wicked world system. Man, we get to enjoy our reward at that event. So help us, God, as your people, uh, to be excited and longing for your return. And in the meantime, get busy doing what we're supposed to be doing, and that's sharing your good news that they can be saved and join us at the rapture before it's too late. And God, as always, if there's anybody even here today that is not born again, would you please save them, Jesus, before it's too late? Please, God, this is not a game. You know that more than we. This is why they're here, if that's the case. Please save them. Rescue them, God. Not only from the wrath that come on this planet, the seven-year tribulation, but hell forever. Oh, God, please, have mercy on them, just like he did with me 26 years ago. So please bless this study even now. We ask all this in your wonderful name, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Well, hey, I'm going to have you another question for you guys. Hopefully this one's not too difficult for you. But uh, how many of you guys ever had a mom? Raise your hand. 
Now, those of you who didn't raise your hand, you're freaking me out, to be honest with you. Uh, because did you know it's been scientifically proven that if you didn't have, your mom, if she didn't have any kids, you won't either? <laughs> Let that settle in later. You might be able to share it at lunch uh, with somebody. Okay. But uh, not just how many guys had moms, but how many guys had moms that gave you that classic mom advice? You know what I'm saying? I mean, it made total sense to her, but you're left there going like, well, what did you just say? Right? Well, this guy puts it in uh, pretty good language. You tell me if you ever had a mom that gave you advice like this. Let's, let's take a look at this. Phrases. My mom used to use phrases. I didn't know what she was talking about half the time. I want you to clean up this room every nook and cranny. Every nook. What is the cranny? Give me some more. I don't, what's, a, what's a nook? I don't know what that is either, you crazy lady. Is my nook dirtier than my cranny? <laughs> well, your nook is fine, but your cranny's filthy. Clean it up now. Clean it up. Pronto. Pronto. See, all she cared about, it's still this day, all she cares about if I have eaten. That's all she cares about. Have you eaten? Have you eaten, son? You look terrible. You look like a freak. You look terrible. Do you need to get something to eat? I'm like, Mom, I weigh 210. No, you look like a little, little freak circus boy. That's what you look like. <laughs> have you eaten? I remember one night, it was like 3 o'clock in the morning. I was in high school. I came home too late. You know, it's dark. You ever do that? You're sneaking in the house. It's just pitch black. So I go in the kitchen, you know, and I turn on the... Oh, no, garbage disposal. Why did they put that stupid garbage disposal thing right by the light? I was expecting a nice warm light. I get, oh, she was on me like a panther. Where were you? I was worried sick. You could have gotten hurt. Have you eaten? Have you eaten? <laughs> all right, how many of you guys had a mom like that? Okay. Yeah, you knew she loved you, and she gave you all this great advice, but man, sometimes you paid a price for it, okay? And folks, believe it or not, I can't think of a, a better way to explain prophetically what's going on in the world today. Did you know that God, too, has given us some great advice? It's right here in the Bible, folks. Uh, and that advice has been around for uh, 2,000 plus years in many instances, okay? And he's definitely shown us his love and concern for us uh, by giving us his son, Jesus Christ. But what's the problem? Our planet, our world refuses to listen. And so unfortunately, the Bible's also very clear, folks. Our planet is headed for a beating of biblical proportions, only it's not going to be from mom's foot. It's going to be from the wrath of Almighty God. The Bible says that our planet is headed for what's called the seven-year tribulation, a time frame where God's wrath is going to be poured out on this planet for seven years nonstop. Again, Jesus said in Matthew 24, speaking of that time frame, that the seven-year tribulation will be a time of greater horror than anything this world has ever seen or will ever see again, and that unless God shortened that time frame, i.e. kept it to just seven years, the entire human race would be destroyed. How many of you guys would say, that's, that's some advice you need to listen to to, to escape that horrible future? right? That's why he sent Jesus Christ, okay? And that's because God's not just a God of wrath. He's a God of love as well. So how does he demonstrate that love? He tells us in advance these things so we're not caught off guard. Number one, if we're a Christian, we're busy being a faithful bride, telling people how to get out of this mess, amen, to escape the wrath of God, right? Number two, if you're not a Christian, if you're not saved, so that you can escape it through Jesus Christ. That's how he demonstrates his love, and it's all over this book. Now, he doesn't tell us the exact day or the hour. As I said, both messages, I think it's common sense. Why? If God told us the exact day and the hour of the rapture, what would we Christians unfortunately do? We would goof off to the very last minute, right? Five minutes to go, oh, I guess I better start serving Jesus. You look like I'm a Christian and good impression. You know, Jesus is about ready to come back. Okay, so he doesn't tell. And for the lost, why doesn't he tell the lost? Because they do the same thing. Oh, I don't need God. I don't need God. Oh, what's that? Five minutes to go? Hey, I guess I better clean up my act and I guess I better uh, accept Jesus as my Savior right now. No. Now, he doesn't tell us the exact day or the hour, but he does give us signs when it's getting close. Okay, now another one of the signs we're going to look at today is this one, folks. This is wild. The Jewish people, the rebuilt Jewish temple, and guess whose head's up there again? President Donald Trump, folks. It is all unfolding right now. Now you're saying, well, what temple is this? Well, as we're going to see in a minute, it's just, you know, the actual temple that the actual Antichrist will go up into and actually commit the actual abomination of the desolation halfway into the seven-year tribulation. That's all. It's unfolding right now, 
Okay? But as always, don't take my word for it. Let's listen to God. So open your Bible. It says 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. If you find 1 Thessalonians, what do you do? Hang it right. All right, you get there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. If you find 3 Thessalonians, what do you do? You throw it away. It's not in the Bible. That's right. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm stalling time for you, folks. Can't have that dead air. That's against the law. So, but uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. How many of you guys ever, when you were a young Christian, you fell for they say, hey, turn to the book of Hezekiah, and you were just whipping up a storm looking for that thing? Anybody? Yeah, you know you're out there. Praise God. Okay. Or the book of Second Opinions, did you fall for that one? All right, never mind. I stalled enough time. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's now read. What does God say about a rebuilt Jewish temple in the last days? Okay, certainly in the seven-year tribulation. Let's say this. Uh, the concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him. What's he talking about? The rapture, right? But continue on. He says, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy or report or letter supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. He's not talking about the rapture of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a different event. The day of the Lord in the scripture, Old and New Testament, is a day of darkness, a day of gloominess. It's a day of God's wrath. When does God's wrath start? At the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. So basically what Paul is saying is concerning the rapture, he says, don't let anybody dupe you into saying that, that supposedly Christians are in the day of the Lord, i.e. in the seven-year tribulation. Do people say that today? Yeah. What's Paul say about that? Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day, not the rapture, the day of the Lord, which starts at the seven-year tribulation moving forward, he says it will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, is revealed. When is the Antichrist revealed? How do you know it's the guy? That's the very event that starts the seven-year tribulation. That is Daniel 9, 27, when the Antichrist makes a covenant with the people of Israel. That's how he is revealed. And that's the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. We leave prior. He says, now this guy, he is doomed to destruction. And here's what he will do in the seven-year tribulation. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped. And he sets himself up where? In God's temple. Listen to what he does proclaiming himself to be God, okay? So what we have here is Paul tells us that in the last days, specifically in the seven-year tribulation, okay, he says that there is going to apparently be a rebuilt Jewish temple at that time, and at the halfway point, you're going to see this event called the abomination of desolation. Paul not only mentions it here in 2 Thessalonians 2, Daniel mentions it in Daniel chapter 9, and then Jesus mentions the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24, but Paul fills in the blank and tells us what that event is. It's when the Antichrist goes up into this rebuilt Jewish temple and has the audacity to say, now worship me, I am God. And that happens at the halfway point of the seven-year tribulation. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm so glad that we see zero signs of the Jewish people even coming close to uh, building this temple that the Antichrist is going to go up into and commit the abomination of desolation. Therefore, we got plenty of time to goof off. Yes, it's called sarcasm to make a point. It's a teaching technique. And uh, are you kidding me? Look at the temple. The Jewish people, I'm telling you, the desire to build this temple is going through the roof. They are ready, okay? And that's what I want to share with you. How do we know it's getting close? That this temple is ready to go in the seven-year tribulation? Because the Jewish desire to build this thing has never been closer than ever before. And I want to share just a little bit of that proof to you today. Folks, the Jewish people, they're not just ready to build this temple. They're ready to build this temple now. N not 50 years down the road, okay? Not five minutes down the road. They are ready to build this temple now, okay? So much so that while you and I are sitting here, they are actually airing commercials, advertising how this generation of Jewish people, we are ready to build the temple now. Let's all build the temple now. And what did we just read? What temple are they talking about? The actual temple in the seven-year tribulation that the Antichrist is going up into to commit the abomination of desolation. But let me just share with you just one. As we sit here, one of their commercials, they're airing, we've got to build this temple now. Let's take a look at that.
going to send chills up your spine. This is the generation. This is, uh, the, we're going to build what? A new Walmart? Who said that? They're ready to build the what? What temple is it, folks? We just read the text. The actual temple that the actual Antichrist is going up into halfway into the seven-year tribulation. They are ready to build that temple now. And apparently the media campaign is working uh, uh, awesome because right now, folks, their desire to ascend the Temple Mount, the Jewish people, is going through the roof. And I mean on a massive scale. You can see a, a, a recent slide here showing the, the uptick. There is a 75% of religious Jews visiting the Temple Mount. And you're saying, okay, so what? So they're visiting the Temple Mount. No, the Temple Mount is where they believe the new temple needs to be built, obviously, right? And, and so they're going there in record numbers, showing their support. We've got to build the temple. The Jewish people are excited about being a nation again. They're excited about uh, having a, a military again. They're excited about that their land is blossoming as a rose in the desert. Again, all these are prophecy-related issues, uh, that they're a united nation, again, all that stuff. But they realize that, listen, we're not a complete people, we're not a complete nation until we get our why. What's the one thing missing? The temple. And they're ready to build that thing now. They're going to the Temple Mount in record numbers. Now, that's not a casual stroll. For the Jewish people to go to the Temple Mount, they are risking beatings, banishment, imprisonment, and sometimes death. You don't just casually walk up there. Now, let me read to you what the actual rules state going to the Temple Mount. We were just there not long ago. It says, uh, Jewish prayer on the Temple Mount is completely forbidden. Forbidden. The Jews may enter only to visit the place and only at limited times. But Muslims are free to pray on the Temple Mount. Jews and Christians, you and I, may only visit the site as tourists. And both of us are forbidden from singing, praying, or making any kind of religious displays. And if you violate these rules, there is an unfortunate price to pay from the Muslim community. Let me give you just two obvious examples. Uh, in 2000, you guys remember Ariel Sharon? former leader there of Israel, uh, he took a delegation to the top of the uh, Temple Mount. The Muslims rioted over that, and it sparked what was called the Second Intifada. Remember what Intifada means? Violent confrontation. It sparked the Second Intifada and resulted in the deaths of more than 4,000 people just by going to the Temple Mount. Uh, even more recently, in 2014, a Muslim uh, shot four times in the chest Rabbi Yehuda Glick. Rabbi Yehuda Glick, we got the studies on him, and, uh, but he's now working in the uh, Knesset, in the Israeli government, uh, including with Benjamin Netanyahu, to encourage him to, to get busy building the temple. That's another story. Uh, but he just asked, back in 2014, he just asked, hey, can, can we Jews pray on the Temple Mount like you guys get to? Four times a shot him in the chest. It's crazy. So, so the fact that they're ascending the Mount, uh, the, the Temple Mount, in record numbers, and it's rising... You need to understand, put in the context, they're doing so at the risk of their lives. But that shows you their desire. We've got to build this temple at all costs. Now, there's a couple different ways that they demonstrate their desire. They've actually built this desire to build the temple to be a complete people, a complete nation, if you will. Got to have this temple. That's the one thing missing. They do it in their national holidays. Now, I don't have time to get into all of them. I'll give you a couple of them. One of their national holidays is called Jerusalem Day. Have you heard of that? It's an annual holiday like we have Memorial Day and all that kind of stuff. Well, they have Jerusalem Day, and that's when they celebrate the recapturing of Jerusalem back in the 1967 war, okay? And not only that, it's a day to not only celebrate the recapture of Jerusalem, but the Temple Mount. And if you're familiar with that day in that six-day war in 1967, that they recaptured Jerusalem and the Temple Mount, and they had ownership of the Temple Mount until shortly thereafter they gave it back. But on this day, Jerusalem Day, every year, the Jewish people are excited, not just, hey, we got Jerusalem back, but they basically are proclaiming, we are the rightful owners of the Temple Mount, and we have all rights to build our temple there. And the Muslims kind of go nuts over that as well. Another event that they have, an annual event in their holidays about the temple, is a holiday called Tisha B'Av. Now, Tisha B'Av is celebrated the ninth day of the month of Av, or basically... Uh, in July, late, mid-July, depends on the year uh, for you and I. And they say it's, quote, the saddest day on the Jewish calendar on which we fast, deprive ourselves, and pray because it's when they remember the destruction of the last holy temple, which would be the one in 70 AD that was destroyed by the Romans. So every year on Tisha B'Av, they remember that. That's why weeping and fasting. But 
It's also an annual reminder, just like Jerusalem Day, that we've got to build that new temple now. In fact, let me share with you another commercial, this one geared towards this holiday called Tisha B'Av, and see what it's all about. Let's take a look at that one. Come on, it's time for shul. You know, it's Tisha B'Av today. Wow. Time to wake up is right. And make what dream a reality? What's the context we're dealing with here, folks? Build a temple. What temple is it? I'm going to say it again. The actual temple that the actual Antichrist goes up into halfway into the seven-year tribulation. Oh, by the way, we leave prior to the seven-year tribulation. Don't know the day nor the hour, but man, is it getting close. It has to be, okay? But boy, I mean, we're all distracted. Talk about time to wake up. What do we do? We're more concerned about the weather. We're more concerned about how's that economy doing? Who's going to win the game? And this is going on in Israel. We are distracted even as Christians. This is what's going on. Now let me give you just one more and then we'll move on to that. Uh, the Jewish people also have an annual reminder. In, in, in fact, it's for each future generation of Jewish people that we've got to build this temple. And believe it or not, they've actually woven it into their marriage ceremony. Okay? How many guys have ever had the privilege of going to a Jewish marriage ceremony? Praise God, all none of you. Okay? But uh, anyway, but listen, you might be familiar with this. If you're familiar with that, at some part of the Jewish marriage ceremony, what they'll do is they'll take a glass, right? And, uh, and then uh, sometimes they'll wrap it in a cloth, but at some point they'll take it and they'll put it on the ground, right? Right? And then they'll, they'll, they'll stomp on that glass and shout, Mazel Tov, and all that stuff. You guys familiar with that? And you're going like, why in the world are they always smashing these glasses? And obviously the reason why is because they got this over surplus of glassware and they've got a creative way of getting rid of it, right? It's because, what are you going to do with it all? No, no, obviously that's not it. Well, believe it or not, this is what most people don't get. The annual smashing of the glass in every Jewish marriage ceremony is an annual reminder to remember that the last temple was shattered and smashed. And it is incumbent upon all future Jewish people to remember we've got to build the next one now. Watch this. This is wild.
Time to build what? Say it again. Repetition increases remembrance. The actual temple that the actual Antichrist is going up into halfway into the seven-year tribulation. Isn't this wild? Folks, this is not bad news. This is frankly good news. Speaking of the wedding day, what's this a reminder for you and I? Doom and gloom. Oh, no. Ah! Are you kidding me? It's a reminder that our wedding day approaches. We're not going into the seven-year tribulation with this temple. We leave prior. All this is news for you and I to get excited about our wedding day. And if you're a born-again Christian, the Bible says we should long for his appearing. Uh, and by the way, I, I've done, as a pastor, I, I can't even count how many weddings I've done over 20-some years of ministry. Right? But I, I've always taken it as a really bad sign that the closer that the wedding day gets when one of the two people getting married get actually upset or start freaking out. That's not a good sign. Usually in a best case scenario, if you're excited about your wedding, you're more excited the closer it gets. And yet the rapture, folks, it's our wedding day basically, right? And when Jesus is coming back to get us, his bride, the church, why is that bad news? Why do people run from that? You know what my experience has been? And I'm talking about the born again Christian. You're violating 1 John 2. Do not love this world nor the things of this world. Otherwise, the love of the Father is not in you. You have been seduced away by this wicked world system. You're committing idolatry. And you're more excited about this world than Jesus coming back, the one who made this world, Colossians 1. Spiritual adultery. But if you're a born-again Christian, this is exciting news. We don't know the day nor the hour, but this is telling us it is getting close. Our wedding day approaches. And it isn't just their desire. It's not just these annual reminders. Uh, I don't have time to go into a whole lot of detail. I'm just going to hit some highlights real quick. We've got uh, full details uh, in our study. But they're building the articles, and they've been doing it for decades. And they basically, in a nutshell, have just about everything that they need to fill up this temple. Okay, I'm talking the golden menorah, the golden flash, the shovels, uh, the ram's horns, the musical instruments, the, the sacrificial knives, the golden lots to determine which animals for sacrifices, the table of showbread, the labor, the incense chalice, the whole nine, nine yards. And also, did you know that they just picked the actual high priest for this temple? Yeah, his name is Rabbi Baruch Kahane. Check it out. They have the high priest ready for this temple. He's being trained as we sit here. And so are the priests and the priesthood. They've been trained for years. Priesthood schools and things of that nature. In fact, um, I was there. I saw the actual implements with my own eyes, but they won't let you take pictures of them. Okay? But I'm going to show you how much of a desire they have to build this temple. And they're ready to go with all the articles. Just need a place to put them in, the temple. Right? Uh, at the Temple Institute. I was just there. And I'm going to share some pictures, just what they would allow me to shoot. And that is just in the gift shop. But just, they got a desire to build this temple like you wouldn't believe, right? But to, let me show you some photos there. there. There's me doing the headshot there, right? The Temple Mount. And of course, the Israeli guys look at that crazy American, right? At the bottom there. But uh, if you're not familiar with the, the, the location, this is at an elevated position directly across from the Temple Mount. So if you were to look that way, you're looking straight at the Temple Mount. Can't miss it. Right? You've got to send several flights of stairs to get there. But that's the Temple Institute. It's right next there. Now, let's go into just the gift shop. At least I'll show you this. This is just one of the hand-woven, everything's done to Old Testament specifications, right? And they're following the Torah, uh, to the, the, the garments for the high priests, okay? Uh, so you get to see that. But then you get to cruise around. Of course, it's about the temple. So they got all, it's a gift shop, right? So they, they got, you know, the 3D, you know, temple. That's kind of cool if you want to build one of those. And, and then I had to share this one, a t-shirt, Guns and Moses, okay? That was kind of a cool one that they had there for you 80s fans. Uh, but not only that, uh, I love this t-shirt. America, don't worry, Israel is behind you, All right? I thought that was pretty cool. But, you know, T-shirts. But you know, let's go back to some artwork. And they show you some there. Beautiful artwork that you could buy there in the gift shop. Uh, and, of course, the classic ones of the previous temple before it was destroyed. And you got the smoke rising up there uh, from the altar. And then you got the priest there and everybody uh, clamoring around there uh, in the temple. And then you got, you know, in the holy of, uh, most holy place there. And the holy, uh, the altar of incense with the, the high priest there and things of that nature. And then all of a sudden they switch gears on you. What's that? That's the actual building of the temple. You can buy artwork there. It's, it's in modern pose. They're just putting the finishing touches on it, on the temple mount there. Here's another one. Another one. You can see a modern uh, cars uh, heading that way, modern traffic. And Oh, by the way, what do you see missing on the temple mount? 
the Alaska Mosque and the Dome of the Rock, it's not there. They, they sell these folks. You can get these art, this artwork in the Temple Institute. This is their desire. This is what they plan on doing. I love this one because it was a, an actual uh, map that they superimposed with, guess what? What they plan on it looking like. Just the temple, the new temple, okay, uh, there on the Temple Mount. And then, of course, yeah, they got some more T-shirts you can buy. The temple, everybody's moving, uh, driving to the temple as if it's in function. Uh, the temple under construction was another one. Uh, and this one I love. The temple is what? It's on the way. Very blunt, folks, with their desire, okay, as we're all distracted over here in America, okay? But what I've learned from three different sources, from three different rabbi accounts, there is one article that they are, have zero plans for building, okay? Can anybody guess what it is? The Ark of the Covenant. They've got all, basically everything else ready to go, right? They just need to get that temple in place. They're ready to go, except for the Ark of the Covenant, because they believe they know exactly where it's at, in fact, they say they've already seen it, they know where it's at, and they're going to bring it out at the appropriate times. This is just one source. This is from Rabbi Rickman, who's the director of the Temple Institute, and he admits they know where it's at, and they're just waiting for the appropriate time to bring it out. But watch this. There are many inquiries about the Ark of the Covenant from all over the world because of the uh, popularity of the issue. For many people, it's uh, something which has a lot of significance. And I know that a very famous uh, book has been written about uh, a theory that it's in Ethiopia, uh, there have been many television specials postulating this theory or that, but I would have to say that according to what I would consider to be the unimpeachable and unbroken chain of transmission and knowledge of the Jewish people, uh, there is no question about the fact that the Ark of the Covenant remains uh, in the same chamber that it was uh, hidden in by Josiah, king of Israel, towards the close of the era of the first temple. That chamber, which had been personally designed by King Solomon, uh, who saw with prophetic enlightenment that eventually the temple would be destroyed. Uh, that was hidden there together with a number of other items. We know where they are. An attempt was made a number of years ago to obtain them. This was not successful. But uh, we certainly believe uh, that when the time comes, the proper time comes, we shall be able to gather these things for their position in the rebuilt temple. So that's why, of all articles, they have zero plans for making the new Ark of the Covenant because they believe they know where the other one's at, okay, from first-hand accounts. And my point is this. They bring that baby out. Do you realize the fervor that would cause for the Jewish people? Even those sitting on the sidelines, should we do the temple, should we not do the temple? Man, it's going to put everything over the edge, isn't it? There will be nothing stopping them at that point if they whip out the actual Ark of the Covenant. But again, I don't have time to get into it, but they've already got the plans. You can even watch the 3D plans online. Uh, of the temple. It's already made. The priests have been trained. Did you know that last fall they started the animal sacrifices again? Mm -hmm. And they're also working on the ceremonies, practicing the ceremonies, also with the new rabbi, Rabbi Baruch Kahane, involved in that process. Uh, the ashes of a red heifer, did you guys realize that happened uh, last fall? Okay, and then I heard a second one is now in existence. She's saying, what's the big deal about that? According to the Old Testament, you have to have the ashes of a pure red heifer Okay, in order for the cleansing rituals needed for the, the, the temple. The problem was they went out of existence with the destruction of the last temple in 70 AD. Guess what just popped on the scene, I kid you not, last fall? A pure red heifer. And I hear they even got now a second one in spare. In fact, just a couple months ago in Jerusalem, in, in, in Israel, they, they just burned a whole heifer, not one of the red heifers, they're holding on to those, but they went ahead and burned a whole heifer just to experiment to see if it created enough ashes for all the Jewish people for these cleansing rituals, and it did. That was just a couple of months ago, folks, as we sit here all distracted uh, by various things, okay? Not only that, uh, as we sit here, in fact, they may have it done already, but I want to show you a picture. You know what that lady's weaving? Her and a bunch of other ladies, this is about 40 minutes north of Jerusalem, Folks, that is the new Holy of Holies veil for the temple. Now, what's wild about that, if you read your Bible and don't skip over parts, Matthew 27 tells us what happened to the last veil, right? This was at uh, Jesus, Matthew 27, 50 through 51. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, what? The curtain or the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split at the death of Jesus Christ. Right? And guess what? They're making another one as we sit here, and it may already, in fact, be done. Not only that, they've also uh, just completed uh, something called the uh, Messiah Scroll, the Messiah Torah Scroll. 
And you're thinking, well, okay, so what's about that? Well, the Jewish people believe the Messiah is going to be here any time. Any time. Okay? Uh, in fact, they're probably more expectant than, unfortunately, many so-called Christians. Okay? And they, they say that when he comes, he can't just read, you know, some average Torah scroll that we have lying around. We've got to make him his own copy. And that's what they did. It, and they just got it done not too long ago. And as you can see here in this final photo, uh, they got it all wrapped up, ready to go to give to the Messiah. Why? Because this will help, quote, usher in the requirements needed, they believe, for the Messiah. Now, not only that, uh, last December, they started to do a fundraiser campaign to drum up the funds to build what's called the Messiah crown. Now, not the high priest crown, okay, which, by the way, I think they spent uh, tens of thousands of dollars, a jewel-encrusted crown for the high priest, not to mention the ephod with all the jewels and stuff. That's all been done. I'm talking about they believe the Messiah is, could be here at any moment, that they are now doing a fundraiser to build and to create the jewel-encrusted crown to place on the Messiah when he comes. Here's their fundraiser. Watch this. <laughs> And you know what we're concerned about? Hey, did you guys see that? It's, it's on the internet again. It's got 47 million hits already. It's only been three days. That cat playing the piano. Do you see that thing? Look at him go. And this is going on in Israel, ready to build the crown to place on the Messiah. Are we distracted or what? It's almost like the enemy is working overtime. Folks, I've skipped over a ton. There's so much more than that. But you might be thinking, wait a second. Okay, so they, obviously they're ready to go for this temple. And what temple is it? The actual temple that the Antichrist will go up into, halfway into the seven-year tribulation. We leave prior at the rapture. Woohoo! time's running out. But how are they going to do this? I mean, you saw the pictures depicted from the actual Temple Institute. There is no al Mas. There is no Dome of the Rock. If they build this temple again, it's going to create World War III. So you can have all the desire, all the implements, all the training, all the priesthood, all the crowns and clothes you want. You're never going to get it done. In fact, the only way that you can get it done is you better have somebody crazy enough to look at the whole world system. They've got to be a powerful world ruler on the planet and just crazy enough to just say to the rest of the world, too bad. We're going to help these people do it anyway. Man, I don't know about you, but uh, it rhymes with Trump. The Jewish people right now believe that our president, yeah, he's elected your president, they firmly believe he's been handpicked by God for the Jewish people at such a time as this. Not just in the moving of Jerusalem, or the acknowledging Jerusalem as the capital with the move of the embassy, we saw the last message, okay? And not just being pro-Israel as we saw on Thursday's message. But they really believe ultimately that our president, President Donald Trump, has been handpicked to help them build this temple. And again, we're seeing a, a re complete reversal on steroids from the Obama years, who, again, was the most anti-God, anti-Christian, anti-Israel president in the history of the United States. And all of a sudden, here comes Donald Trump. And he is now the biggest supporter of Israel in a multitude of ways. And they're saying that, listen, this is not by chance. This is from God. And it comes from prophetic invocations, right? This is what they're saying. Watch this. Rabbi Yosef Berger says Trump will build what? This is their words. 
The, I'm not saying thus saith the Lord. I'm just saying this is what they believe about our president. He will build the third temple in Jerusalem. U.S. President Donald Trump's unabashed support for the Jewish state and his public recognition of Jerusalem as its capital has many Israelis electrified. The current American leader's positive attitude towards Israel seems nearly illogical, especially after decades of far more hostile trends. Can I translate that for you? Especially after the Obama years. And then here comes Trump. With all this crazy, awesome support, this has got to be from God. That's what they believe. He says, that's why I believe the reason for this shift is that Trump has a big role in playing what? The building of the third temple and the coming of the Messiah. Okay, let's continue on. This uh, other rabbi, he also working for the United Temple Mount. He said, words of prophecy are coming forth from the Bible and becoming facts. While Muslims jeer, Israelis cheer, President Trump's Jerusalem Declaration, prompting Jewish religious activists to suggest what? Building the third temple is closer to a reality than ever before. What he did was an enormous step in bringing the temple. Do you get it? Yes, they're glad that he is supporting and backing Israel. Yes, they're glad about the move of the embassy to Jerusalem. Yes, they're glad even recently he is saying that the Jewish people are the rightful owners of the Golan Heights. They're excited about all that. But ultimately they think what? He's also the guy who has the power to back us to do what everybody says could never happen. The building of the temple. He says there's been many amazing advances towards bringing the temple this year. It was clear that Trump was part of that process, listen, guided by Hashem. In other words, guided by God. In fact, so much so, folks, that they believe that our president, okay, is going to be the guy to help him build the temple. Okay, that they've actually produced temple coins with our president's head on it next to King Cyrus. Now, why is that important? Because we saw in the last message, King Cyrus... Okay, Isaiah 45, and Trump's the 45th president. People say that's kind of interesting, right? Uh, he was the guy, the last guy, secular guy, who helped them build the second temple. So they're calling our president the new Cyrus, okay? And they're putting their money where their mouth is, okay? Now, I actually got them with me, and uh, uh, the actual coins, and when we're done, Lord willing... We'll have them at the table. We don't sell them or anything, but you got to come and just check it out with yourself, okay? But this is the, one of the first ones they came out with. It's the silver half shekel coin, right? Now, can you, you can all see that, right? Yeah, I, I didn't think so. So let me, let me show you some close-ups here. But you can clearly see, and by the way, this is not plastic. This is the real deal, right? This is our president's head on it next to King Cyrus. And what does it say there? Temple coin, right? Lest there be any doubt, you flip it over and you see a picture of the temple. Now, a lot of people say that, well, these coins are just commemorative. Well, maybe some of the other ones, but not this one. This is from the Mikdash Temple Educational Center, okay? And they say, and I quote, the temple movement and the Jewish Sanhedrin issues the half-shuckle coin with the profile of Trump and Cyrus, the likes of which the Torah mandates every Jewish male must donate to the temple with a weight of exactly 9.5 grams in real silver. And that's what this is. So technically, this one could actually be an actual temple coin used in that temple. Isn't that weird? I'm telling you, you've got to come check it out. But that's just the beginning of that one. Now, if you want to pay a little bit more money and a bigger box, you get the next one. This one's wild. This is the gold-plated coin. And again, we brought uh, Big Brother Technology. We will be watching you at the table back there. No, uh, just kidding. Uh, maybe. But uh, this is actually gold-plated. This is heavy, okay, gold-plated. And uh, for those of you who obviously don't have eyesight of a rabbit, okay, let's take a look and let me uh, get that for you. Here, of course, as you can see with the gold on it, but let's remove the gold so you can see what's going on with this coin, right? You can see our president's head again with King Cyrus. Why? because they think he's the new Cyrus to build this next temple. You see the Persian seal on the left and the American seal on the right. Then they quote Ezra, and he charged me to build him a house, a temple, where? In Jerusalem. And again, lest there be any doubt, there's the, the dove flying back to the temple, and they're quoting Isaiah 60 like a dove uh, to their nest, meaning the temple. So that's that one. Now, they just recently came out with, if you want to spend more money, you get a box with inside of a box. And it's not just a white box. Inside that white box is a wooden, delicate box. And this guy here, uh, they just came out with it. 
This one is basically like the previous coin, but it's solid silver. Not silver plated, solid silver with our president's head on it. Again, he is the new Cyrus. And again, let me give you a close up there. Again, similar to the gold plated one, but this one is solid silver. It's all about building the temple. So they actually believe that he is going to be the guy to do it. Okay, and that's why they're putting these out. Okay, now, not only that, what's interesting is they appeal to our president's background and expertise. Because what did President Trump do before he became President Trump? He wasn't just a builder. What is he known for? Building big edifices that are very fancy, very luxurious. Folks, the temple's going to be one of those edifices. Gold all over the place, all kinds of precious gems and things of that nature. And so they actually appeal to his background and, dare I say, his ego. Build this baby. You'll always be remembered for that. Watch this. This is a quote from Rabbi Kenneth Cohen. This is crazy. He says, Mr. Trump, rebuild the third temple. You're the most powerful man on the earth, and when it comes to the Middle East, every president has tried to build his legacy by forcing an unrealistic settlement on the parties of conflict. Right? He says, it's never going to work. Right? He says, I would like to suggest that you build your legacy in a way that hasn't been attempted for a few thousand years. Mr. Trump, you have developed some of the most amazing building projects in your career. He says, rebuilding the third temple would be your most ambitious project thus far. Think he'd bite off on that one? I think he would. Right? He says, I realize we might have a little problem with the Alaska Mosque as well as the Dome of the Rock. That's called the understatement of the year. Okay? But listen to what he says. And this is really viable if you can get somebody to back you on the world scene to do it. He says, our modern technology will allow us to move these buildings to Mecca without causing any damage to the structures. And we do have that technology. So that really is an option. He said, now as for the details as to how to do the actual construction, who's ready to assist you? The Temple Institute. Folks, they've been ready. Ready, just waiting for the political backing to pull it off. He says, rumor has it there's even a red heifer waiting for service. I've heard now two. So many people laughed at you when you decided to run for president. They're not laughing anymore, including Hillary. <laughs> he says, I know you like challenges and you want to make your mark on the world. As crazy as all this sounds, Mr. Trump, you might just be the one to pull this off. Oh, and by the way, as an added bonus for getting the job done, will be the coming of the Messiah. As we sit here watching that cat go crazy. Wow, we're running out of time. Now, another interesting thing, I'm not here to support uh, numerology or anything, but I'm just sharing you what the rabbis think is very special about our president. Uh, they point out that the numerical value of Donald Trump's name equals the phrase Mashiach ben David or Messiah son of David. Now, they don't believe he is the Messiah, but they believe that our president is going to be used by God as a part of the process of ushering in the Messiah be that as it may. But they also bring up some other interesting calculations. They bring up the fact that Trump was born 700 days before Israel became a nation. He won the election on Prime Minister Netanyahu's seventh year, seventh month, and seventh day in office. And he served his first full day in the White House at the age of 70 years, seven months, and seven days old. I checked the math on that. That's accurate. Isn't that crazy? As one guy says this, he says, hey, we should be careful reading too much into these numbers, but it sure would seem that God has had his hand on the unusual rise of Donald Trump, and if so, would have a particular purpose for his presidency. And if you ask the Jewish people, it's to help him build this temple. As we saw written 2,000 years ago for you and I, what temple is it? The actual temple that the actual Antichrist is going to go up into halfway into the seven-year tribulation. And we leave prior. So obviously, the, 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 for you and I, what we need to do in conclusion is we need to run, freak out, hide, go to the hills. Ah! No, who keeps saying that? Whatever. We're going to talk to you later. Okay. No, what, what are we supposed to do? Get excited, man. Are you kidding me? This is great news. This is best case scenario. Because we all know when the rapture happens, we all go to Walmart. <laughs> Way better if you actually read the Bible, which I highly recommend. No. What's Jesus say? When these things begin to take place, what do you do? You don't freak out. Stand up. Lift up your head. Woo-hoo! Your redemption draws near. We're out of this joint. In fact, as we close, you've been sitting around for a long time. Uh, let me encourage you with this exercise. So let's go ahead and stand up. Let's go ahead and stand up. And, uh, you know, you hear from the world today, you know, you got to be healthy, you got to eat right, all this fitness stuff and all that and what have you. And, and you know, and, and uh, you know, you always hear this phrase, you got you to get in shape, you got to get in shape. Hey, last time I checked, round is a shape, mission accomplished for, you know, if that's going to encourage some of you. Uh, 
But hey, there, there is actually one exercise that I highly recommend, and I really think it would be ultimately beneficial to us as Christians that we really need to start this exercise program, okay? And you do it three times a day, okay? When you get up, break away, you know, around noontime and before you go to bed, but three times a day, just do this exercise. It will really bless you as a Christian. So let's just practice. Just do this. Okay, that's called rapture practice. You may be seated. Okay, go ahead and you can sit down. Right? Folks, we don't know the day nor the hour, but man, we are running out of time, are we not? God doesn't tell us the exact, exact time, but man, he's given us signs. It is getting close. It's closer than it's ever been. And so what do we do as a bride? We long for his appearing. Wouldn't it be great? We, the Bible says in Romans chapter 11 that the Jewish people are under a temporary blindness, Right? It's not permanent, but when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, God's eyes go back on the Jewish people because he's not done with them, right? So who's that last Gentile to get saved? I don't know. God knows. But wouldn't that be the coolest way to leave this earth? As a Christian, we're a faithful bride, and, and we're just witness to somebody, right? And, and we're, we're grabbing hands with him. We're holding in prayer, and, 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 then, and both of us say, and in Jesus' name, boom, and we leave. Now, that's the ultimate way to go. But can I tell you something? Christian, right now in your walk with Jesus Christ, not what you hope to in the future, not memories of the past, right now, how's your walk with Jesus Christ? And if the rapture were to happen today, and it could, did you realize Jesus is going to find you doing something? Let that sink in. He will find you doing something. And based on your current walk with Jesus Christ, are you being a faithful bride? Will you even come in close to be witnessing to anybody? Maybe you haven't even witnessed in a long time. As Pastor Max said, have you, do you even pray? Are you even reading the, the Bible? Is that the state you want him to find you in? Hey, praise God, we're saved by his grace, by his mercy, not of our works, amen? Otherwise, we're all doomed straight to hell, myself included. So praise God, we're going to get there. If you're born again Christian, you're going in the rapture, Amen? but he's going to find you doing something. Don't you love him? Don't you, don't you want to be found being faithful? Think about that. As we close, hey, listen, the rapture is awesome. You want to be in the rapture. You don't want to be left behind because the Bible is very clear. At the rapture, again, man, we get sucked up off this earth. We meet the Lord in the clouds and all this baloney fades away. But right after the rapture, shortly thereafter, I don't know the exact date of the hour, but man, shortly after that, bang, God's wrath is going to be poured out on this planet for seven years nonstop. You don't want to be here. And so if you're not saved, you need to get saved right now. This is not a game. It might look something like this. We'll close in prayer after this.
Church, that's why we're still here. God is not willing that any should perish. Where his mouth, his hands, his feet. Where the newspaper boy and the newspaper girl declaring the good news. God has made a way through Jesus Christ so that whosoever would come and believe on him would be rescued from the wrath to come. Who cares about that stupid cat on a stupid piano? We have the privilege to share the greatest news of all. That God has made a way to escape his judgment. Let's be faithful to that message. And if you're not a Christian, I don't know your heart. You can fool me, but you can't fool God. And if you're not sure, you better get sure today. Make sure you're ready. Because it's only through Jesus is how you escape the wrath to come. Turn to him. Ask him to forgive you of all of your sins. He will. Confess him as Lord, the Bible says. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the grave. And you will be saved. Do it now. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for our studies. Thank you for your word. Thank you for telling us in advance what would come. But thank you that you provided a way out through your son Jesus Christ. And he is faithful. And he's a loving, wonderful shepherd. And he's willing to forgive us of anything and everything we've ever done. And even as your children, nobody has a brighter future than us. We don't have to be afraid of anything. You tell us to be of good courage. You tell us specifically not to be afraid. Not even worry. Not even be anxious about anything. Because you've got everything under control and we belong to you. And we will never be placed under your wrath. But help us, God, to finish faithful. To not get distracted. And God is always there. Again, if there's anybody here today, if they're not saved, save them now. Just like you did with me, God, 26 years ago. I wasn't even looking for you. And you still loved me enough to chase me down. Would you please chase them down today and save them before it's too late? But please bless these studies to these lives that belong to you. Cause us to be faithful, not fearful, in these last days. We ask all this in your wonderful name, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.